everyone, and welcome to Fright Bites, your source for short horror reviews. I'm the Fear Fan, and today I thought I'd try something a little different. While I love reviewing horror movies, it recently occurred to me that there were a lot of interesting subjects that I was able to touch on in my reviews, but that I was never able to discuss in the detail that I'd like. Take a look at my review of Friday the 13th Part 3. At one point, I started to talk about why Jason's mask works as well as it does, but I wasn't able to go into it too deeply, or it would have turned into a long rambling tangent. So instead, I decided to turn this entire episode into a long rambling tangent. That's right, in order to talk about some of the subjects that we get short shrift in a review, I'm going to be putting out a series of editorials that I'm calling State of Fear. And what better place to start than with the subject that inspired me to make these in the first place. What's in a good mask? Anybody who's watched any number of slasher movies knows that to make an awesome killer, you need three things. An awesome background slash personality, an iconic weapon, and a badass distinctive look. But why is that last one so important? And why do some cinematic serial killers succeed, where others meet with a colder reception and just fade away? After years of thinking about this way too much, I've boiled it down to two factors. First, the purely visual one. Let's face it, as grotesque as some of these guys are, there's always a definite visual appeal to them. Somehow, they make ugly look good. But, on a less superficial level, I think the real hook comes from the fact that their looks work metaphorically as well as aesthetically. I talked a bit about Jason before, but let's take a closer look. Yeah, a huge machete-wielding guy with a hockey mask is an imposing image, but why does the hockey mask work so much better than his Mr. Potato Head days? Well, while we can plainly see he's deformed from the visible parts of his skull, something you couldn't see when he was pretending to be the world's worst mascot for Idaho potatoes, we should look a little bit closer at the mask itself. While it's got some of the basic features of a human face, eyes, nose, even a mouth, none of them seem to be quite the right size or shape. Also, its expression is always completely blank never showing a trace of pity, anger, fear, or any other recognizable emotion. And what better look for a soulless, deformed serial killer than a soulless, deformed mask? In the very real way, the mask is Jason's face, and perhaps that's why whatever is under the mask never quite manages to be as unsettling as the unwavering stare of those unblinking eye holes. The same can be said of Jason's inspiration, Michael Myers. It's not that the idea of a pasty-faced William Shatner dressed as a mechanic is inherently terrifying, although alright, maybe it kind of is, it's what the mask symbolizes that's frightening. Again, a perfectly blank, emotionless face, as utterly still and unchanging as the man who sat for years in a mental institution, inhumanly patient for his chance to escape. And what about a more modern killer, like Ghostface? Some might say the costume looks a little generic, like something anybody could pick up at a five and dime. But take a closer look. Ghostface has never been the same person twice, and the villains in each successive movie in the franchise were essentially doing a Ghostface impression based on the Stab movies, the franchise within the franchise based on the events of the first movie. On top of that, never knowing who the killer might be and suspecting everyone is a major plot point in each film. Suddenly, the fact that the costume seems a bit generic, something that anyone could slip on, seems a lot more important, doesn't it? But what about killers that don't wear a mask? Guys like Freddy Krueger and Chucky. Does this still apply to them? Oddly enough, yeah, it still does. Don't believe me? Alright then, picture Freddy and Chucky. That they look like this and like this, right? Eh. Sorry, this is what Freddy Krueger and Charles Lee Ray really look like. Think about Freddy for a second. Yes, he looks like he does because he was burned to death, but he's a disembodied spirit. He's shown dozens of times that he's got the ability to appear any way he wants, so that means he's choosing to appear as a horribly burned monster with questionable fashion sense. Why? Because he knows it will inspire the maximum amount of terror in his victims, and really, doesn't that tell you exactly what kind of person he is? As for Chucky, he may not have intended to look this way, but that stunted, oddly inhuman shape is still a perfect fit for the twisted soul that inhabits it. In a way, their very bodies are their masks, and it fits them to a T. So, am I saying that all a slasher villain needs to succeed is a good look? Hell no! They need to have a distinct, interesting personality, and either bring something new to the series with every installment, like the Nightmare on Elm Street series did, or keep refining and improving their formula like Jason in Friday the 13th. Still, a villain with a memorable look goes a long way, and all the best ones seem to have a lot more going on under the hood than meets the eye. Anyway, that's my take on it. Think I hit the nail on the head? Think I'm full of crap? Either way, I'd love to know. Go ahead and give me a message at my email address, or let me know in the comments. Either way, I'll be listening, and I'll see you next time on Fright Bites.
Hands 